So we're beginning another gathering room or gathering pod if you're listening to this later. And beginning, that's a thing. It's a difficult thing, but it's also a very important thing. Now, there is a quote that is attributed to Wolfgang Goethe. Is that his first name? Goethe? Um, Anyway, he said, whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Ooh, that just makes you want to begin something, right? It means that beginning itself is like a box that has genius, power, and magic in it. And if you just unlock it, all these riches will pour out. And I believe that that is true. However, (laughs) there's a lot of resistance to beginning. I have found this to be true in my own life. And I've also found it to be true that no matter how many times you begin, you always have to begin again. Like what happens if you write a book and you it's it goes out there and even it does well you have to begin another book um what happens if you finish a project yay celebration you'll probably begin another project what happens if you begin a relationship yay wonderful but you're going to have more relationships of all kinds throughout your life so there's always going to be a beginning going on somewhere And beginnings are fraught with confusion and hesitation and mistakes. I think that's why Goethe had to say to people, go, go do it. Because we'd rather do things that are familiar. We have have really, really resist going from what we're familiar with to something we're not familiar with. It requires that we kind of let go of who we have been, what we've been doing, and then go into something unknown. Ooh, the amygdala does not like that. Every time you see something that's even unfamiliar, it doesn't have to be threatening, but you get this little kick of fear. Your brain is actually designed to fear anything unusual or new, unfamiliar. So every day we're facing beginnings and every single time it's something new, even if it's something that we've done before, it's not, we haven't done this one before. So every morning when I get up, it's like, oh, I have to begin a day again. I have to begin this day again. Every time, like I clean up after dinner. That's one of my household jobs. After we all have dinner, everybody else goes and takes care of other people and I clean up. And it's like every night I'm like, oh, I have to begin this again. Um, Every time I start a new task of any kind, like it, it with like life coaching, I have to begin again, get a new client, begin again, whatever it is, we're always, always beginning. So it may have genius power and magic in it, but it also has a lot of aversion attached to it. It is, there are things that are distinctly unfun. And every time, if you're trained as one of my life coaches, you know that every time you start something new, you go through this death and rebirth phase that is very disorienting. And it's not something in our particular culture that we're trained to cope with. We're supposed to just keep keep things going well, right? The idea of beginning again and again and again and again is kind of anathema to the way we think. We'd rather just hunker in and do what we know. But beginning always comes, always comes, always comes. So how do you begin? I'm kind of sitting at the beginning of a lot of things right now. So I, I've been like facing it and Ro and I are both beginning new novels. And um, yesterday, Ro called me and said, I've had a huge breakthrough about my writing and why I haven't begun. And I was all excited. And she told me about it. And sure enough, she had found a way to begin by knowing the way that she herself prefers to slide into a new activity. So she had taken beginning not as something I have to do to make something else happen, but as an end in itself. So just, isn't that, I love the delicious paradox of that. To begin, to make beginning easier, you see beginning as an end in itself. The very phenomenon of beginning can become your friend. If you start to see beginning as a thing that is your friend, you will have a friend that never deserts you because there will always be new things beginning. But how do you make a friend? out of beginning when it's so truculent and so difficult. So here we turn to, I knew you saw this coming, the trans theoretical model of change. 
Yeah. That just means they took a whole bunch of schools of psychology, mushed them together and said, how do you begin? And they, they came up with, a, with six steps, six. The first one is pre-contemplation. You don't even know the change is coming. So that you got that, you're done <laughs> with that step. You've already taken one of the steps of your next beginning. You don't think about it. Step one, pre-contemplation. Then there's contemplation. Then there's preparation. And only then is there action. Now, once you've got to action, you're into the, into the change. You, you, you maintain that for a while and then you get to the end of that particular task and then it comes up again. You haven't even been contemplating the next thing, but here it comes and now you're contemplating. So I wanna focus on contemplation and preparation because those are the places where we don't give ourselves enough time and space and credit and tools. Um, it's like, just get started like a robot, just start. Um, instead, you have to give adequate time to your contemplation and preparation. And think of contemplation as plowing a field, like breaking up the soil of your old way of thinking, your old way of being. You have to put things, you have to jumble things a bit before you can actually plant new seeds. You don't just go drop them on the ground that's been trampled down. You actually have to break up the things that you've been thinking of doing and you break them up first in your mind. So just if I were to say, uh, I'm, say I decided that I'm going to do what I did with my last nonfiction book, with my the current book that I'm writing that is nonfiction. I'm writing two books at the same time. Um, I would work from 10 to noon every day, and that was sacred writing time. I haven't been doing that with this next book. But if I sit and imagine, okay, tomorrow I'm going to get up. This is I'm going to go down. I'm going to have my coffee. I'm going to connect with my loved ones. I'm going to, and then it, I'm going to go upstairs and I'm going to do my sacred writing time 10 to noon. If I picture that, I'm already breaking up the field of the time that's coming up. The field is what I'm used to doing and I'm breaking it up by imagining something new. So you picture it and then think of it in little chunks. Never think, okay, I have to begin to write that book. <sighs> No, never ever think in terms of a chunk that's gonna take you more than like five minutes. When I go to clean up after dinner, I don't do it as a unitary thing. I, I have a very particular order and this is my preparation. I've like contemplated it. First, I deal with all the food that's left over, put it in the fridge, whatever. Then I deal with all the silverware. Then I deal with all the cups and glasses. Then I deal with all the plates, then the pots and pans, then I wipe everything down. I have the same order every time and I never plan to do it all. I only plan ever to like put one dish of leftover food away. And then I begin the next task. So it's, I've actually created tons of beginnings, but they're all little tiny things. And it's much, 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 the trans theoretical model has shown, it is much, much, much more likely that you will begin something if it's a little something just make a little something and every big thing is made up of little things so chunk it chunk it chunk it do you know that's why we have like dashes in our phone numbers because the mind cannot handle like a 10 digit code but if you break it into three and four and three you know, <laughs> my mind can't handle anything what is it we have the area code is three then our prefix is three then four so that is 10 altogether. You can't handle 10 numbers at once, but you can handle three, three, and four. The magic number is five. The brain can take chunks of five. Okay, so that's the first thing. Chunk it, chunk it, chunk it. Prepare the field. Then you will come as you approach the actual preparation to the junction of curiosity and fear. I told you the amygdala goes, ah, when you start to do anything new, but it also goes, oh, and one of the best ways you can get your, um, your, yourself moving is to give yourself FOMO, fear of missing out by watching someone else doing the activity. So literally, like I have to declutter my closets. I will go on TV, I will go on the internet and find shows about people decluttering. They look like they're having such a good time and I can see the steps they're taking. And that will make me much more likely to go do it myself. But first I do it in my mind. I watch other people. I think about it myself. I chunk it, chunk it. Then I watch other people, talk to other people, get ideas. 
by the way, am I the only one who felt a deep, deep surge of gratitude and satisfaction when Marie Kondo, the author of Life Changing Magic of Tidying Up, she said that she had, since she, the birth of her third child, she had basically given up on tidying. <laughs> oh, that made me love her so much. Anyway, so then trick yourself into starting by first setting up your physical environment so you're more likely to do the thing, whatever it is. So you like have the task. I, I printed out, I'm not talking well. I printed out the manuscript of the book that I'm working on and I took it and I put it in the place where I usually write. And that was like all I could do for the day, but it's right there. That's one step closer to me actually picking it up, reading it. It's also important to fool yourself into thinking of the step as not very big by imagining what will come after it. And the way this works, this is how you give a dog a pill. You get a piece of food, you mush the pill in it. Then you get a bigger piece of food, a more delicious piece of food. You hold them both out. The dog will just hork the first one because it's trying to get to the second one. And it, it just swallows it whole, it doesn't have to chew it. If it chews it, it will find the pill and drop it on the floor if you are my dog. So my point here is that I don't think I'm gonna sit down and write my book. I think I'm gonna sit down, write my book, and then I'm gonna take a bath. Like I always hold out the, the reward right away before I even get started. And then I move into action with what I call icebreakers. Icebreakers are the little ships, these little powerful ships that used to sail the North Atlantic and they would have these really hard, like knife-like steel prows and they would cut into the ice. They were little ships, but they could bash up ice and then the big ships could, could come in after one. So there's something writers call the magic 250 where you sit down and write 250 words and see where it takes you. Um, if I wanna start a watercolor, I will take down a piece of paper that it takes me about five minutes. That's an icebreaker for me. Um, today I took, I, I have texted myself all these notes for my nonfiction book. I took them out of my text field and I put them in a Google document where I can access them. That's an icebreaker. So through all of these steps, I will run through them, contemplate by imagining something, but in small chunks turn toward curiosity instead of fear. Get curious by watching other people do something. Your curious little inner animal will be like, what? Then trick yourself into starting by thinking of the, the next thing and move into action with little icebreakers. Now, this is all very pragmatic, life coachy stuff, right? But then you get to a really profound spiritual dimension, which is that if you do these things, you begin to achieve what I said a minute ago you are starting to make friends with beginning as an end in itself. And you are claiming and reveling in the acceptance of yourself as always beginning, beginning, beginning. Because beginning has, has genius power and magic in it. So instead of being afraid of it and moving away, you go out and actually start looking for new, be new things to begin so that you can, you can be with your friend beginning which always breaks open and reveals all this magic inside it, even though you have so much resistance to it. And every time you begin, and all that happens as I age is that I begin more times. <laughs> I never finish. Um, I love T.S. Eliot's line um, that, that we shall not cease from exploration and the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. It's like you go into beginning again and when you start to realize it's a friend, every time it shows up, you're like, oh, you, I remember you. And you go into it with more skill, with more wisdom, with more actual, maybe even pleasure sometimes. And also with this anticipation of something magical happening. Because it's like, begin. if, if you think of things as always slipping away in permanence, you know, everything dies, everything, everything's slipping away. You can also look at beginning as, we live in a world where everything is always arising, 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 arising. And what's new? What's coming next? If you're always a beginner, you're continually surprised by your friend beginning, by the different kinds of genius power and magic that come out of it. And then you're much more at home in the world because we live in a world of impermanence and beginning is always gonna be right next to you. So you might as well make it a friend. 
So let's go to, that's what I have to say about that. Now I'm going to go to my question boxes. Aha, here they are. And they are, they are tiny. I will make them bigger. Oh, I can't. Okay. <clears throat> so constellations in her bones says, with your spidey senses, is growth necessarily fraught with discomfort, discomfort, or is that the historical way? How is creating art a way to expand and evolve? Are beginnings invitations to celebrate it all? That's a great set of questions, constellations in her bones. Let me think, let me unpack that. Um, is, it, if, is growth necessarily fraught with discomfort? It depends on how you define discomfort. Like, there are two kinds of pain, psychological pain. One um, in ACT, ACT therapy, um, acceptance and commitment therapy. Stephen Hayes call these clean pain, calls these clean pain and dirty pain. Clean pain comes from events, like getting punched in the face. Dirty pain comes from our thoughts about those events. So with, is growth always uncomfortable? I would say in a sense it is. It actually has to be. It has to break the old system. However, that is clean pain. And if you experience it without dirty pain, without thinking negative thoughts about it, even the discomfort of it becomes more appetizing. Like I have told you before about my amazing physical therapist. And she always, literally every single week for months and months, I go in there and she gives me completely different exercises. I don't know how she comes up with these things. The one thing I know is that she's gonna find a shred of muscle I've never used and she's gonna make me use it until I want to vomit. And it's frightening. I have a friend who referred me to her and he's, we're both always frightened when we go, but we're also really looking forward to the delicious sense of getting activity into a part of the body that hasn't been used enough, of beginning something. It's very aversive and very appealing at the same time because it's uncomfortable, but not mentally disturbing. So I accept the discomfort with, a, with the attitude of making beginning a friend, and it's a different kind of discomfort, but you have to accept it's gonna be there. Um, City Lotus says, amazing, I'm in a decluttering club where we declutter together on Zoom. Oh my God, that's amazing. I, yeah, Rose been doing this, this with writing, going on Zoom and just writing with people. The, the power of the pack activity, like not packing, but in a pack, is so powerful for us social primates, even me. And I'm like very, very um, in not inverted, <laughs> introverted. I'm very inverted. I'm upside down right now. It's just all positioned that way. Um, that is, if you can find a club for whatever you're beginning, join that club or just like zoom into it or watch it on TV, as I said, because it will always get that little amygdala going, whoo, whoo, what? That little monkey mind. The monkey mind will make you crazy and it will also make you creative. So foster it. Okay, I'm the Valerie says, how to get around the fear and time pressure when beginning a new project and having been given a clear deadline already? Wow, what a great question. Because all the things that make it mechanical and forced, you have to do it. Here's the deadline. It's interesting that so many people think that goal setting like that, like smart goals, what is it? Um, specific, measurable, time bounded, actionable, all these different um, descriptors of how to make a change work. They're really, really good, but you, you can't force yourself to do things just because you've made a deadline and it's looming. In fact, the fear, as I'm the Valerie says, the fear and time pressure start to crush in on you. So somehow it's the same um, paradox that we see like when we watch performers at the Olympics and stuff who are going out there doing incredibly difficult things under enormous pressure. And what they're always saying in the stands is, she just needs to relax. And people will say to you as you go to do something hard, just be yourself. That is so super duper hard to do. So making friends with beginning as an end in itself is to me a refuge because the, the deadline is not my friend, it's my enemy. I, I fear it and it shuts me down. So I don't look at the end. 
I look at the beginning instead and I say, how do I think you through in tiny chunks and then make it appetizing and curious to slide in and create action priming so that I just start to begin things. Once you have begun, the genius power and magic will take over and you may start to roll. And I actually learned to do that by writing I call them for Oprah Magazine every day, every month, <laughs> every month for 17 years, and I never missed a month. Um, and I rarely missed deadlines. My first editor is probably out there laughing at me right now. Um, I did miss some, but I, I got them in on time, uh, in time for publication. And um, it was really hard. I was, it was really scary. And I had to get, I had to fall in love with beginning over and over and over and over again. And even though the, the magazine isn't being published anymore, I can generalize that to other tasks. So when I hear deadline, I take my eyes off the end and put it right on the beginning. I try to make it joyful. And then the time, you know, you can, you can get rolling and you make your deadline. All right, Roses, what do you think? Why do you think beginnings are so scary? Is it simply a fear of the unknown? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, if you read about how the brain reacts to unfamiliarity. It's just like, no, we did not evolve for the level of change we live in. Um, I've probably mentioned to you before, Catherine May's wonderful book, The Electricity of Every Living Thing. It's a memoir she wrote about um, walking these vast distances in England, but also about self-diagnosing as autistic and she talks about how I would never have had to cope with the amount, the pace and acceleration of change and the time pressures that we put on ourselves now if I'd been born a few hundred years earlier. So we're living in a time of pressure and deadlines that is made, I will say it again, for robots and machines. And we are not robots and machines. We are creatures and souls. And those creatures and souls need to be cajoled, cuddled, tempted into beginning because you can't just point a machine at it and say, do the thing. There's no power, genius power and magic in putting a robot on a task. Unless you have to begin to put robots on tasks, in which case my hat is off to you, robot designers, you're amazing. That it must have been hard to begin. So yeah, it's fear of the unknown and we have to deal with it much more than we ever had to do. So use every little thing you can to be friends with beginning. Donna says, what if you're successful at the beginning, but the continuing and following through gets you stuck? I love new things and beginnings, but I find I drop them after a while. How do I stop dropping things? You do it by beginning every day. You don't keep writing a book. You begin writing it again. Uh, you know, you don't say, oh, I have to write page 30. You begin page 30. You don't write uh, 10 chapters. You write the chapter in front of you. And then when that's done, you begin again. Yes, it's hard to keep up with momentum, but if you fall in love with beginning, beginner's mind, which is such a very, very fundamental part of a lot of Asian philosophy, then you can treat every moment as a new beginning and every moment shows itself as your friend. So you can sustain momentum if you think of it in tiny bits and not long bits. Anne says, I find the preparation stage to be so much fun. However, I wonder if this is a false sense of starting. Plus the ending of this good feeling seems to intensify the fear and the dread of the action stage. I can really get stuck here. Any ideas to make this less jolting? I think what some of the other folks have been saying uh, about like getting other people there with you, making a commitment to show up with other people, um, that can be really helpful. All the chunking, all the turtle stepping, taking little tiny steps, but also know that your particular brain likes the preparation. Some people don't. Some people like to finish things. They like to come into a project that's almost done and polish it up. Uh, if you are a preparer, then indulge in that a lot, but know that you're going to have to do a lot of action priming to move into the action step and do it in tiny, tiny, tiny little ice breaking steps. Bring out all the ice breaking tools you can. That just means tinier chunks, more company, more incentive, look at the next thing after your the thing you're going to do. Everything I've mentioned here, it's all just, it's, it's really like animal training. You really are training a wild animal to do something that makes it nervous and um, you'll get used to it. 
Jessica says, this syncs up with me so well today. I just started learning to embroider because I had mastered some other artistic pursuits. I love the beginning feeling, but sometimes I get excited about too many things at once. How do you decide what to begin, Martha? Well, I have a lot of ADD, like I have serious ADD. So I begin about 20 things at once, and then I rush spasmodically from one to the other going, ah, 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 ask my family, they will tell you, I do not exaggerate. So what I do is there's a part I've talked about in other gathering rooms in inter internal family systems theory, where they look at the different parts of the self, they talk about one major self with a capital S, which is the wise one who knows the whole scope of your life and everything. Now, the things that I've been telling you are sort of more uh, like the, the soldiers that go out to the front and do the work. The general sitting in the back is the self, capital S. So you can sit there and say, all right, in the overall framework of my life, what do I need to begin next? And then you can see how the parts of you that get it done, how they feel about it. So for example, for me right now, starting an art project is more appealing than starting a writing project. But my self knows that I've got a contract and I've got a certain number of months to do the work. And so it sits gently with my, uh, my artistic part and says, honey, we're gonna have to put down the paintbrush for a few hours every day and we're gonna do some tiny little icebreakers on your writing. Don't worry, we're gonna do 250 words. I, I did that yesterday, and as I got into about 100 word territory, I felt a different kind, a different self coming in, a different part, and it was quite entranced with writing. And it didn't wanna, I hadn't wanted to stop painting, but I was entranced with writing. And then um, it was my turn to be with Lila, and I got entranced by her. You get entranced once you start things. It's the Goethe quote again, it has genius, power, and magic. Start the new thing and, um, and let yourself, capital S, decide what to do next and have a nice little negotiation with it about what comes next and then take those first few steps into action and see if the genius, power, and magic arise. If not, the self may have to give you uh, bigger treats, smaller chunks. Go back to the what I said earlier in this uh, broadcast and just up the ante a little bit. Okay, Deborah says, why does my brain get more inspired to begin when it sees or thinks about worst case scenarios? For example, watching hoarders can make me want to start decluttering right away, but perfect homes make me want to give up. How interesting. Um, I don't have that experience. When I watch hoarders, I want to give up. But when I see perfect homes, I also want to give up. I want to see people going between the two. I want to see people getting from the hoarder state into the perfect or more perfect state. It's that action. I don't like steady state things. I don't think steady state things are real. No house is perfect unless you leave it there and seal it up. And even then it's going to decay. And I think our souls know that everything's meant to move. So if you need to get beginning, look at action, not status quo, whether it's hoarders or perfection. Unless you get super motivated by watching hoarders, go for it. I mean, use whatever works for you. But for me, looking at the flow of something is what makes me want to begin. Finally, Mary says, great to hear about Rose Breakthrough. Do you think Rose work, um, Rose, what works because that's part of her conative style? Would it make sense for each of us to feel into our conative style to see how we begin, to see if there are ways each of us could benefit from specific, specific styles of beginning. Those of you who've never heard the term conative, it refers, it's a very obscure English word, but it means the way we preferentially take action. And there are four different kinds. Um, some people go directly into movement. That's what I do. I'm, that's probably what I just said about seeing things move makes me want to start them. So I'm what's called a quick start. Um, then there is a fact finder who wants to do research and figure it all out. Ro is more fact finder than I am. So part of hers is doing a lot of the research and setting everything up. Then there's follow throughs. Those, these are people who work with systems and need to make a system or find a system like getting on a Zoom with other people and plug into the system. And then finally, there are people who are implementers who need to actually physically move the body 
in order to get started on something. I am an implementer too. So even though the stuff I'm doing is very quiet, like writing, I only really come up with good ideas when I'm in motion. So if I get stuck, I immediately go to the gym or go for a walk or like just watch something out the window as long as it's moving. So yeah, long answer to the very last question, but cognitive style is a really, really powerful thing. And it comes from the work of Kathy Colby, K-O-L-B-E. And if you've never heard of it, you should definitely go look up Kathy Colby, cognitive styles, go to her website, take a little test, see what you like doing, and then begin in that way. So there's, I'm sure my way of beginning is just one, but I've worked with many, many, many people by this point in my life. And I know that some combination of those things will always get someone moving, um, if anything will. Maybe they won't ever start moving, but if they are going to, they will start with contemplation, preparation, then action. And this works better and better and better the more you realize that this process is an end in itself. Beginning is a beautiful place. It's a beautiful friend. And if you learn to love it, then over and over and over, we, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of our exploring every time, a, a million times, will, to be, will be to arrive where we started at beginning and know the place for the first time. So I hope you begin something wonderful today, and I hope you notice that something wonderful is always beginning out there, even with other things happening and, and ebbing away. Begin, begin, begin. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. So go begin and find your genius power and magic, and I'll see you again on The Gathering Room. Bye!